there? Yes, there are slides. You were surprised there. <laughs> it was it's totally, totally magic. Uh, welcome to uh, talk about Getty, or rather the journey to uh, why we are moving away from Fabricator. So I'll stand here so that we actually have a microphone. Perfect. Um, first of all, who here knows what Fabricator is? Could I see hands? Great. So mostly these are people who know about Fabricator. Fabricator is the software behind developer.blender.org. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's good about it, what we want to save, what we really do not want to save, and why we are having to go from something entirely different in the first place. Uh, I would also like to see hands of who here enjoys the Wi-Fi. Is it working for you guys? Yeah? Perfect, because I'm also doing that kind of stuff. So if there's any problems with Wi-Fi or networking or you need anything on the network side, please try to get into contact with me and I'll try to set you up. Right, let's start. So first things first, Fabricator, what is it? Uh, if you look at Fabricator, it's a forge. It's what a lot of people call a SourceForge, but you know, SourceForge.net is already taken, but that's basically what it is. It's, a, it's an organization, a tool around a repository of software. Um, so it deals with codes, it deals with teams, it deals with projects. It tries to make it that you can work with multiple people on a project, do commits, do reviews, do quality uh, uh, control over what you're doing. So what is Fabricator? That's what it does. It lives on developer.blender.org. Most people here know that. Uh, why? Uh, well, why? Uh, basically, Fabricator got uh, created in a, in a kind of intermezzo moment between uh, SourceForge, a number of other types of uh, uh, forges that came up, uh, and the rise of Git and GitHub and GitHub clones. So Fabricator is kind of in this shady area uh, where it does a couple of cool things that the others didn't yet, but it didn't figure out the magic bullet that a lot of others seem to have replicated. Not, of, not all of what we're doing now in GitHub or GitLab or whatever is a perfect workflow, but it is better than what Fabricator came up with in a number of ways, not all of them. So this is not the Fabricator kicking conference, that's, that's, that's to tomorrow, uh, but <laughs> there are definitely some things that we, uh, we wanna get rid of in Fabricator. Um, nice thing is it's CVS agnostic-ish. In design, it can work with Git and SVN, but in t theory, it could work with other types of CVSs. Uh, I have not seen implementations of this, but it's possible. It's flex flexibly configurable. Um, if you have any kind of organization or any kind of project that you'd like to work on and you put a fabricator in, probably some people can drag some applications together and make things work in the way that works for your team. So that's kind of cool. Uh, that is also the flip side. When you look at a Fabricator instance, you kind of never know exactly how somebody put it together. Uh, it can be completely uniquely weird for the people that you, uh, uh, you meet uh, running a Fabricator instance. So with that in mind, our Blender Fabricator use is not necessarily exactly the same as everybody else's Fabricator use, which also complicates migration and moving to something else later uh, uh, at some point, which I'll touch up on later. It's extensible, there's a lot of applications, these are the extra things that you can do. What's better, and it was open source, is open source. Um, there are some weird features or quirks. Um, the way that it works internally is very complicated, touched on some of that uh, later. Uh, one of the biggest things, of course, uh, most people will know, uh, but if you don't, it is end of life. Uh, it is a Facebook project. Um, it was hosted on uh, The Forge, I believe it was called, PH Forge. Um, and basically they said, look, uh, we're closing shop. We're stopping development of software. We're stopping hosting of any projects. You will have to do something else. That's the message that basically kicked that off. Uh, and it meant that Blender was on a platform which technically worked. There's no technical reason why we couldn't keep on using it, but it would mean that security patches, if there's anything wrong with the product, uh, with, with it, we would own those problems directly and have to develop, uh, have to put developer time into that. Slowly collapsing community, because of course, if you throw this type of bomb, people will say, yeah, well, I'm moving. So you kind of don't have people to ask things about anymore. No new features get suggested or integrated. 
there is now a, a new development uh, group that's kind of taking what uh, Fabricator had and uh, is making a community supported version. Uh, but that took a year before that kind of took shape and the shape is still not very clear. So might or might not uh, sink or float. Uh, and the uh, hold off uh, meant that we were not able to actually say, let's, let's implement a couple of cool features in our use of developer.blender.org that we'd really like because we don't know how long we're going to be staying on this. Uh, so that's damaging to, uh, to things. So um, I came into uh, employment of Blender at the beginning of this year. Um, who am I? I'm an ISP guy. Uh, I worked at two or three Dutch ISPs, depending on how you t uh, count. Uh, do a lot with Linux, nerds. Uh, I built a render cluster uh, for uh, Blender. So that's just a cluster around Sintel time. Uh, they needed uh, render hardware. I was a nerd. They found the nerd and uh, uh, that became a, a project and the project became an obsession and the obsession became a render cluster. Uh, now basically I'm employed as both Sorry, not both because there's three things. So I am sysadmining, I am network uh, guy for DC and the studio in, in parts and I'm also doing DevOps. So the DevOps part is mainly our BuildBot infrastructure, which is building our, uh, our, our product uh, and making sure that people can test against versions. And of course, it's part of the, uh, the Gitty trans uh, transition, which has become the Gitty transition is now also part of that. Uh, and yes, to get, give you an idea of when I started, coaxial cables were a thing still then. <laughs> so, uh, problem statement. We have hundreds of developers spread around the globe. They're not necessarily in one place. Uh, it is a big project. Um, we have one large repository, which is, as projects go, quite large indeed. It's, uh, it's almost a gig of just assets that you pull in just for the Git uh, stuff. Uh, that doesn't include documentation, that doesn't include uh, static libraries. There's all kinds of other stuff spread around that also is part of just Blender core. And then there's stuff like, you know, small hobby things like flamenco and whatever, <laughs> what, what have you. <laughs> um, we have the problem or the, the opportunity to get rid of SVN. Um, SVN is uh, running for the documentation translations. Uh, that's something that we need to get rid of at some point. It was on the roadmap already, uh, exploring Git LFS, but SVN is still with us, so that's a challenge we will have to tackle at the same time. And uh, there's another thing which is very important for the whole selection or the whole problem statement, which is if we were a commercial com uh, company, we would call GitHub and say, hey, uh, give us one of those boxes that you sell and uh, we'll hang it up somewhere and uh, we will pay you good dollars, blah, 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 and uh, we will keep it in-house, blah. That's not who we are. <laughs> We're not going to do that. That's absolutely out. We have a number of things that we find really, really important, which is everything we do, we do because of the grace of the community and we want to be able to give back to the community, which means that even the technical solutions that we choose, we would like to have as an example for others to reuse later. So uh, others, need to be able to benefit. Uh, we want to have our own infra running as much as possible. This is not possible or even useful for everything. Uh, like, you know, hosting a top level dot blender domain, for example, might be a bit excessive, but you know, other things uh, like a Git uh, a, a, a source, code ho a source code hosting system is kind of, you know, core to what we do. So this is one of the things that we really want to keep on site not have it run somewhere for free or whatever, really on site in our own hands. And uh, we prefer open source solutions over other types of solutions, obviously. Um, so some of the things that we decided upon quickly is, look, we're not gonna try and find something that can do SVN. It's the, the pool of selection is just too small. Uh, we're not gonna find something that's gonna do that. So SVN is gonna drop off the, one and a half list. Um, change is inevitable regarding workflow. Uh, this touches upon something I'll t uh, say later, but basically change on our workflow uh, is related to the fact that the way that people use Git in the typical GitHub, GitLab, uh, etc. workflows means you make a, a branch, a feature branch, or you make even a clone and you pick, make a branch, so you do pull, pull request from there. 
this is kind of not what Fabricator needs you to do, uh, which, is, uh, which is a way that we can't keep on doing. That's kind of inevitable. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we need to do the whole GitHub workflow the way that GitHub says it should be or whatever, because this is an open field and I'll touch that uh, up upon that later. Um, Git workflow based um, is what a lot of devs want or know, meaning we get a lot of people coming in uh, to, the, uh, to the development uh, 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 community who ask like, where, where's your Git thing, right? And then we do have a Git repository, but we have developer.blender.org fabricator as the way to interact with code. Now, it has a couple of really good features, but Arcanist is something that it's interesting to explain to new people. <laughs> um, so just having something that you can actually say, look, look at a generic GitHub uh, 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 manual or just Git manual, you'll probably find out how things work. It's kind of handy. Um, planning process changes are inevitable. So this is kind of uh, regarding uh, work boards, uh, the way that we handle projects and teams, that's also gonna change. Um, but these are things that we said, look, these are things that we were daring to touch and daring to kind of change on the way to a different uh, thing. And one of the things that we will have to also let go or know that we will have to let go is the loose coupling of what uh, the CVS, in this case Git, does and Forge nodes. What I mean with this is Fabricator allows you to send in a patch and you don't have to tell where the patch came from. It doesn't even have to be, you know, a Blender repo that doesn't have changes that we don't know. It's just a patch and you don't even have to tell it what kind of commit hash belonged to the patch to make it. So it's like, here, here is something, apply it at some point and see if it fits and then it gets better. Later, when you decide, hey, your patch is approved, we're gonna, you know, apply it and commit it. Then theoretically, there is of course a commit hash in Git. This is optional in Fabricator. So there are applied, accepted, committed, hash, uh, committed patches in Blender where we do not know the commit hash for in Fabricator. It's, it's just an optional field. You do not have to supply it. This is not something that most other uh, forges allow, permit, or think is even a good idea. This is also something which we'll basically need to start fixing to go to any kind of other forge. Why? Uh, so Git is the do a dominant player. Most people, uh, most people uh, don't use SVN anymore so much. So we're go just gonna touch on Git. Uh, Fabricator's pull requests are very loosely coupled. I just uh, touched on that. And GitHub is the uh, dominant player, if you like it or not. Uh, and it uh, has defined a lot of expectations about what people, uh, you know, want to see on a, on, a, on a forge. So how did we start? In, on the 9th of February, I did one of the first uh, presentations inside of the studio for just, you know, the... the, the the local available developers uh, for the organization, like, hey, I'm gonna stick time into this. This is what I think we can do, which means we'll start talking with developers. I've browsed uh, doing a lot of Jitsi talks with a fair number of people that uh, were very closely related to committing things directly into master in, in, uh, in the GitHub repo. Uh, this does not mean that I got all developers because there, as, as said, there's quite a few. Uh, but I concentrated on a number who had either strong opinions about certain workflows or strong knowledge about workflows or strong knowledge about challenges that we will be facing. Um, if, and I'll come to this later, if you are here and you are a developer and you would like to be heard about things, this is also why the dev, uh, the dev attic is here. We can meet and we will be able to talk about all the topics that have not been touched yet. And towards the end of the presentation, it will be also more clear what these topics are. Uh, uh, there's a dev talk, uh, there's a series of dev talk topics which have a number of small threads about, hey, this is where we are, this is what we're doing. Um, and we were trying to focus on which options do we even have? Like if you go away from Fabricator, where do you go to? Um, 
There are many options. Uh, a lot of them are uh, things that somebody developed but kind of got abandoned. Some things are used by one organization only. Um, GitLab is one of the big ones that is actually an open source solution available. And there's also a, a, um, a supporter tier or uh, open source open source project offering that is not open source, which is really weird, but basically it means that you can get the ultimate tier GitLab project uh, product uh, and even run it yourself on your own infrastructure uh, as long as you only do open source stuff with it. So the product itself, it would not be open source, uh, but the stuff that you do with it needs to be open source. Now we looked at this for a long time uh, and there's, oh, there's a spelling mistake there also. Um, but uh, one of the big things there is basically anything that we add, any extension that we create, anything that we start modifying, we cannot release as an open source thing. So that kind of bites directly, it doesn't sit well. Um, the open source offering from GitLab has a lot of stuff going for it, super complete, has a lot of stuff, but it has a couple of artificial limitations because there's a commercial tier that they want to be able to sell, which is fair. Uh, but the limitations that we saw in the open source offering were at, of such a, a, a magnitude that we said, look, we're, we're always going to be, you know, having trouble doing our workflow with what the open source tool can do. So theoretically, and you can make, you know, patches against the open source version and commit them upstream, but there's no way that those would actually be accepted by an organization that also sells these features for money. So that became a, a big discussion like, oh, we could be, you know, so quick, maybe, uh, probably they'll have support for this and that, blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't sit well with our, uh, with our ideals. And there's something about this ideals things. If they're optional, then they're not ideals. So GitLab, uh, we did look at it. Uh, we did some soul searching. We decided these do not fit, fit well. Uh, there's a, uh, another project called Pajur. Uh, I hope I pronounce it correctly, uh, or I'm butchering the, uh, the French language. Um, it has nice features. It has some kind of uh, really tight coupling with source and documentation, so that if you do anything with the source, the documentation creation kind of flows out of it uh, uh, automatically, or at least you can do that if you do it the right way. It's used by Red Hat. Um, however, it seems to be a dead end in the sense that you don't get a sense that many people are either using it, uh, extending it, or writing about it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's quite feature complete. And then there's Gitty. Uh, Gitty is a, um, a continuation or a rewrite or an exploration of what the COGS uh, project left behind when some other people said, look, we want to extend it uh, a different way. And that became Gitty or Gittia. Uh, I've heard that it's Gitty, so we'll, we'll keep Gitty for this presentation. Uh, it's relatively young in the sense that the 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 amount of prof prof professionalization after they kind of split off took a while for them to settle, but they now are are quite up to speed, and I'll touch upon that uh, a little bit later. So we did a test setup uh, mostly with Gitty, but I installed a number of hours as well. Um, looking at communities around the projects, like do people use this? What are they writing? What are their experiences, etc. And we uh, re-looked at our goals regarding our values and intentions. So that's the GitLab part, like, hey, we could, but no, we can't, or we shouldn't. Uh, around July, we said, hey, let's let's stop, you know, saying, oh, we could or we should, or maybe somebody will will magically uh, commit something to GitHub, which we can directly use. Uh, but we said, no, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, go for Gitty. Uh, it has the best fit with, with the things that we need and want, uh, but there are definitely a number of challenges that we need to uh, uh, figure out. However, it's fully open source and it has goals that align with a lot of what we are also trying to achieve. Um, they are really an open source uh, group. They really want to have the open source communities grow by having a good, uh, solid uh, uh, forge software available to people. They also also offer a support organization. So 
um, they are able to support people who want to do a small or large scale uh, Git implementation inside an organization or uh, just in general, uh, including adding code and having that be released in the open source uh, sphere as well. Uh, they also are one of the few that had a uh, curated extension repository, meaning they have a number of extensions available that allow you to interoperate with CI CD, like BuildBot or uh, Drone, uh, and it's quite well maintained. Uh, so that gives you an idea of, hey, the base that these uh, extensions are programming against is at least stable enough that you don't you know, implement something that might change uh, somewhere halfway, uh, which creates trust. Uh, and it has familiar features that correspond to the well-known platforms, meaning for better or worse, some people would call it a, Git a GitHub clone, uh, but it presents things in a way that is familiar, but is not the same as GitHub and allows you to find things if you're familiar with a GitHub type of experience. So that's done then. Uh, we installed that, we click play on tape and uh, then we're done which is uh, sadly <laughs> not how a migration of something like Fabricator works uh, and not at our scale. So I call this the work. Uh, I should have made it all capitals maybe. Uh, Fabricator uses it, uh, there's challenges and these are some of the challenges or weird things. Uh, and this is maybe why the talk is interesting for people uh, who might bump into this later. Fabricator uses a database per application. Now an application is something like issues, which they call manifests, that's an application. Uh, differential uh, is the thing where uh, uh, patches and pull requests live, uh, and they are a database. Each application is its own database. It's not its own table, it's an, its own database. Now, for the people who are familiar with SQL, it works well within a database, but it doesn't work between databases. So you have a relational model of data that relates to each other because you have users that committed something and leads to a pull request, which might be a task, but none of it works with SQL. You have to pull one in, look at it and say, oh, I need to do another SQL statement to another database to figure out what's going on. Luckily, there is a API, uh, the Conduit API, which allows you to pull data out of Fabricator in a semi-documented semi way, um, which is kind of convoluted. Um, there's a couple of interesting things to note. Email addresses are not accessible from Fabricator. This is by design, meaning if you have a user, you're not actually able to know who to mail when you, your user is doing something bad, which would be great if there was a great in-system messaging system, but that isn't there or didn't get implemented. So, your users are there, they do stuff, but you're not able to communicate with them except in manifest task comments or something. I don't know how they envision this, but it's, uh, it's by design. I can understand that, especially if you're Facebook and you're harvesting email addresses, you kind of want to say, oh, we can't even get them out ourselves, <laughs> nor can you. Um, but we, we did need this for things like uh, uh, being able to port over our users and mail them like, hey, now stuff is going to happen somewhere else. Uh, and uh, a lot of other stuff is uh, abstracted away as in the transaction. So if you have a manifest, manifest is uh, tasks, uh, issues, uh, and the whole comment thread underneath are transactions. So you pull the, you pull the task object and you say, I want to see all the transactions of the task object. You get an immense ton of JSON out there, and some of it relates to an actual text comment. Some are actions that happened, like I closed, opened something. Some of them are null, which apparently is internal housekeeping stuff. It's not documented. You should ignore it according to all wisdom on the internet. Uh, but that's, that's a challenge, right? Like, what do you do with this stuff? Um, Patches and pull requests loosely uh, coupled to Git reality. This is something I touched on already. You have no strong relation. So if it is in Fabricator, doesn't mean that Git knows about it. Or if it happened in Git, it's not necessarily Fabricator thinks happened. You have to verify this or you have to even invent data. Uh, and we, I'll touch upon some of this. Uh, and we have the Blender project uh, uses very specific way of doing certain things. 
which is not necessarily how Fabricator was designed to use. Very simple example is if you have a project like Blender, you can make a sub project called Blender 2.8 and Blender 3 and Blender 3.2, uh, which would be the logical way to do it because you have the Blender project and sub project. But it turns out that if you do it that way, your project planning workboard tool does not allow you to make a workboard specific to that sub project. It can only do it on top level projects. So then you get all the design goals for all the projects and you can't focus on the Blender 3.0 only. Meaning Blender, uh, the organization said, look, we're going to make everything a top level project. So we have top level projects, Blender and B Blender 3.8, uh, sorry, this is not a pre-announcement of a new release. <laughs> 2.8, 3.0, etc., etc. So the way that things are organized is not necessarily something that is directly translatable to what Fabricator thinks an organization should be doing. Uh, meaning there are going to be some migration challenges that we have uniquely to our situation. Uh, that's why there is a Blender Fabricator migration tool, which will have to make some assumptions based on the reality of how we put our uh, projects and our organization together in Fabricator. Um, which is not to say that that tool won't be useful for other people doing stuff, but there will be stuff in there like, hey, this is something we did specifically and are fixing this. There's other stuff. So everything in Fabricator is a FID, uh, a Fabricator ID. Uh, uh, or an ex exact FID, uh, which is basically uh, the transaction uh, uh, object that relates to a FID. And all of these have a super long thing, including users, including everything. So if you find anything out of a database, you have no clue what it is until you actually pull that object in and look at it and say, oh, it's, it's my user object and it's aren't. Uh, so that, that's, you know, not so handy. Uh, but that's how it works. Return strings from condu uh, Conduit can contain multiple null characters. For the programmers under you, this should be you know, a big warning flag. Uh, for the others, uh, a null character terminates a string, so you have doubly terminated strings coming back, which for, for better or worse was not what I expected. Um, there is a user called none, which is his name. There's a user called deleted user, which is his name or her name. I don't know. And there's a user called null, which apparently is also a name that somebody chose. And there's the user none, which is actually not a user. It's a deleted user. So I was uh, uh, doing um, uh, debugging of this and uh, I had one comment thread that actually had the user none and, uh, and the none user in one. And I was figuring, uh, trying to figure out like why why, why am I hitting the, oh, it's that one, it's, it's, it's that object. Because again, everything has a fit, and until you look at it, you don't actually know uh, what's, uh, what's happening. Um, let's see, there's non-UTF-8 uh, 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 strings in uh, UTF-8, uh, and some people use the title uh, for the bug, bug report uh, thing. So they just change titles all the time. You don't actually have a comment thread, they just change the title every time they want to say something. Uh, <laughs> really great stuff. Um, some things were simple to do. Authentication against Blender ID, done. OAuth, uh, really su uh, simple. Expert of data, a fabricator is doable. We even got the emails out with SQL. We have Git-T uh, has support for uh, migrations of everything, and they are able to dump it into a directory of YAML files. Now, this creates an, uh, a, a great uh, opportunity, because what if, what if we magically don't dump something, but just create an artificial directory of YAML files in the right way with a, an other tool, uh, and then have it import uh, by git -T. So we create something that was not created by git but git will take. Um, there were a number of things that we needed to, uh, to implement. Uh, priorities were one, uh, there were no native priorities, so something could have a tag label, uh, 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 critical and not important at the same time. We are fixing that. Uh, flexible workboards, we want to have workboards that you can actually uh, uh, create based on a query, so give me a workboard that matches these specifics. 
uh, complex import types we needed. Uh, the migration tooling had the option to import stuff uh, as comments, meaning text, uh, but not events. So if somebody says subscriber added or topic changed, that was just, you know, the only thing you could do was text. So we had to fix that. Uh, and for that reason, we got into touch with the, uh, with the Getty people. Uh, we became their second or third support customer, depends a bit. They, they already had one at least. And then we were the second or third depending on how they count, I don't know. Code work is done on future the Blender project, uh, future of projects of Blender.org. Not everything there represents the state of where we are at this point, but that's where we, uh, where we do stuff. Uh, we have a wonderful guy, Mati Ranta, uh, working on that, who is part of the Getty organization, and uh, we have weekly uh, 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 Jitsi uh, meetings to discuss uh, uh, progress, etc. They've been great on implementing the feature requests. These are the ones uh, I touched upon already, and badge support, so the badges in Fabricator, where you can see if somebody is a studio supporter or something. Uh, that's already implemented and available. They're doing operational support, so understanding what the migration challenges are. They give us information about, like, hey, this is what we can expect to happen. This is what it will do to a Git repo, which is super large, yes or no. Uh, and they've actually done something interesting, which is uh, baseless patching matching. So they took all the patches that we don't have a base for and said, hey, we know the date it was created, so let's just do a Git bisect and see if we can, uh, can match it in uh, into the Git uh, repo at that point in time. And if it matches, great, that's now your commit hash. Um, this, is not, uh, this is not foolproof, because if you create a new file, it will match any repo, <laughs> it will commit cleanly, no problem. Uh, so we'll have to look at that, but this has solved uh, things up to 700 or so uh, patches that we need to look at. Uh, documenting uh, process for organizations with the same challenge is a big thing that we're doing, so they are also helping with that, making sure that we document, like, this is what Fabricator does, this is what Gitty does, and this is how you can move from one to the other. Uh, all features for that are, uh, are available for inclusion upstream, so if there's anything useful, which is generally useful, like priority labels, etc., will be included in the Gitty upstream. Uh, and that long, long <laughs> URL, uh, is findable via the Future of Projects Blender.org. Uh, also, will lead you to a readme file, which leads to a wiki pages of that repo, which doc documents a lot of the migration challenges. So it, it discusses, this is what we did, this is what we saw, this is how you translate this type to another. Uh, I, about five minutes ago, I got a cue saying, hey, you have two minutes left. <laughs> so this is the main, most important one, and then I'll uh, uh, cut off. Is that still doable? Perfect. Tech feature-wise, we're kind of there. Um, process project-wise is something that I'd like to work on uh, at this conference with developers and especially module owners, etc., to kind of feel and get a feel of what their process is right now and what their ideal process would be in a more GitHub-like workflow. So I would like to invite people who, who are interested in that to get into touch with me. Saturday I have a second talk, which is mostly an introduction into the features of Git and what we expect to be possible workflows that we want developers to uh, consider. Uh, this, this deck has not been written at all. Literally not even the title has been written yet in, in, in press or anything, meaning it's completely open, so it's going to change its nature based on the interaction that we can have during the, uh, the Blender conference. Um, and next to that, once we have that done and we do uh, know what the migration is going to look like, what it means for people, it will also mean something for the community at large. That we have a lot of people who do bug reports, who interact with Blender via developer.blender.org or, or related things. So we want to have them know that it's going to move to something else and how it's going to work and where to find the information, etc. The, uh, the ambition is to have this be at the end of the year. Uh, maybe beginning of next year, but the end of the year is the ambition to see, look, we can switch over. Uh, and the shape of the transition is also not completely determined. We don't know if we're going to be able to pull everything or if, for example, translations will keep on SVN and tackle the Git LFS migration later, if we can. And that is my next talk. It's on Saturday. I don't know exactly the time. 
The developer attic here is a good place to be uh, if you want to talk to me or other developers about this. If you see me running around and you're like, hey, I would like to have an hour of your time, please do so and we'll sit down somewhere and we'll, uh, we'll sketch something out. Um, we have another cool guy, Jason van Gomster. Give him a good hand of applause, people! <laughs> No pressure, but he's also doing a talk. Uh, it's, uh, it's about build chain uh, things. So if you want to set up a build chain for Blender uh, at your local studio or even at your local residence, he will explain what challenges are and how you could approach this. You can find me on Blender chat. My name is Arndt. Uh, Code to Blender, I have some stuff. Dev talk, and I even have a YouTube channel now. <sighs> and my email is uh, arndt.blender.org. This has been my TED talk, and uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>